Hey, what's up guys? So I just came out of a meeting with uh, a couple of founders that uh, I'm an external advisor for. And I thought that some of the takeaways from that meeting could actually be valuable to all of you. So I'm just gonna, uh, in an unstructured format, share uh, meeting content and the main takeaways. So a bit of background. The founders have been going for three or four years, two guys, um, they due to COVID, they couldn't close their series A, hadn't grown quite fast enough, um, but they just closed a bridge round. They sit at maybe 600,000 US dollars ARR, um, and they're growing at 10% a month. Everything's fine. They have a good team. Uh, like every other startup, they're you know, working with the organization, trying to work the acquisitions funnels and so forth to do more growth. So we were talking about what does it take for these guys to raise the series A, which due to the bridge round they just closed, they actually need to close in around eight or nine months. So the meeting was that they came up with, let's say a list of criteria KPIs that they had come up with that they wanted to close. So they had, we want to be at 2 million AR US dollars. And we want to have net dollar retention of above one. We want to have 5% of our customers in the German market. We want to have, and so forth. They had, I think nine criteria overall. And I took a look at it and said, well, all of these criteria that you have are, we could windle it down to maybe four or five, maybe three, and these would be necessary criteria. So you need to hit an ARR goal. You need to have not horrible churn, so forth. All of these things need to be in place, but they're not enough. You can't raise a Series A based on numbers alone. You can't raise Series A just because you grew 300% and you have the right ARR. This is a misconception. And I think it's a mission conception with a lot of founders because they actually don't really know why investors, VC funds, invests in Series A. And the reason is, let's say, if you boil it down, you say, well, the reason to invest in a Series A is because you sense as an investor that there's a very high likelihood that this startup is going to reach Series B. So there is a mismatch between what the founders are trying to show, which is look at all the great performance we had in the past. And what the VCs are looking for, which is what kind of performance will they have in the future, right? And so founders really, if they want to raise their CSA A and B and so forth, needs to prepare for this discussion and use their past numbers to show their future numbers. So it's all about the projection. And a lot of founders misses this very central point in fundraising, which is you can't just do hard numbers pointing backwards and then have fussy PowerPoints and vision statements going forward, you actually need the hard numbers to go forward. One of the reasons I think this is that, that a lot of founders misses this is that that's not the case at early stage. When you raise pre-seed rounds or seed rounds, it's all about the vision statement and the PowerPoint and the strength of the founding team and so forth. So, and these are important, they are, but it turns much more into an Excel sheet, spreadsheet exercise as you move up the, the steps of the funding chain. So as you go from C to series A, B, C, so forth. At the end, the meetings with the founding teams are almost courtesy calls. It's all about the Excel. And one of the reasons for this, which I think founders in some way need to wrap their head around is who are the actual end buyer? It goes something like this. You pitch to VC, the VC essentially buys the stock, funds the company. Then the VC has to look at the next VC, who has to look at the next VC, who has to look at, and then at some point it's not a VC anymore. Then it's one or two people generally, could be one or three. You could sell to a trade buyer, which is fine. A lot of startups get sold to a trade buyer. If that's not the case, you could sell to either a private equity fund or you IPO. If you sell to a private equity fund, you just push the question a little bit further because the private equity fund now has to do an IPO, sell to another private equity fund or sell to a trade buyer. So the private equity fund will have the same mindset here. So what happens usually is that if you IPO, which is the end goal of a lot of different types of startups, or if you sit in any of the other big corporate finance departments, really the kind of mindset that that person has, that that buyer has in these offices is that of a pension fund manager. So these guys know business, but they don't know your business. What I mean by that is they try to break down any business into a spreadsheet. They will say, okay, I have no idea about 
you know, calibrating thermometers or doing uh, enterprise workflow in this division or whatever it is that your business is about. But they do know revenues, costs, profits, timelines, and so forth. So they try to break all that down into this sort of structural mathematical language of business and then decide if they want to do an acquisition or not. So really what you want to do is, so, and the reason that this is the case in the IPO is that the venture fund manager or your board, when you IPO, go to an investment banker who then wraps all this up into essentially a sales pitch that they then take to the public market. The public market by and large in an IPO consists of pension fund managers, because these are the guys who get to evaluate the case prior to the opening bell and actually sort of pre-purchase a lot of the stocks. There can also be family offices and so forth, but they have sort of the same mindset. So this is, this is one of the reasons that everybody at the later stages of the funding chain start to sort of structure the narrative around your startup as if they were pitching to a pension fund manager, because at the end, someone has to manage the asset who is not intimately familiar with the narrative of the story, which means that they have to translate it into spreadsheet. For that reason, your KPIs, your ARR growth, your storytelling of your net of your startup, at least from series A, sometimes only from series B, a little bit depending on where you are, but, but I would argue that from series A and forward really should be about building that spreadsheet saying, Hey, look guys, I have all these great business results and these are how they fit into your spreadsheet. These are, this is how I would build the model to show that, okay, we're 2 million ARR. But we can definitely hit 100 million and here's how we would hit a billion and it's all about breaking down the market breaking down the customer sizes breaking down the acquisition funnels making it into a math quiz that your target audience the investors can actually solve so instead of actually aiming for a series a you should do a little bit like the the sprinters at the olympics who get coached in not aiming at the finish line, but actually running through it. So you don't want to get to a series A, you want to run through the series A all the way to the target sort of goal line of a, of beyond of IPO exit series B, whatever it is, because that is also how you're going to be evaluated and whether or not you're going to be essentially granted or given that series A by an investor. In this particular case with these guys, I said, okay, if you, if you want to start building that Excel sheet, for your investors. Here's how we do it. Build an Excel sheet. And then at the whatever bottom right corner, you write 100 million AR. So that's the end goal. This is roughly sort of the unicorn status of sort of the agreed upon revenue target for a unicorn. Your mileage may vary, but write whatever end goal revenue you have in mind. Okay. hundred million AR. That's when we exit. And then you work backwards from there. You're going to say, okay, when we hit that, how many customers will we have at what ACV? So if our ACV currently is 10,000, then we need 10,000 customers to hit a hundred million. Okay. So where are these 10,000 customers? Are they all in our home market? If they're in the U S maybe that's true. If you're in a European country, that's unlikely to be true. So now, now that means internationalization for you. So that means that you want to go to, if you're in Germany, you want to go to France. If you're in France, you might want to go to the UK whatever you might want to go to the us and so forth so you want to figure out where are my customers what markets are they in okay what types of customers do i have are they all 10,000 acv or is it really consisting of a few hundred thousand acv and a lot of five thousand ACVs? okay so you break it down into segments and then for each of these geographies and segments maybe product types depending on how your business is set up there usually is a specific acquisition method so maybe your cheaper product is a self-service product-led growth sale, which is really marketing driven. So you break that down into, okay, so we pay for marketing and then we have a conversion rate of 3% of whatever. So we need to sort of fund that this much and we can do it in these and these ways in order to generate this much revenue. So one customer costs us X. At the other end where we have 100,000 ACV, we have outbound sales. We have, you know, sales reps, they work in this way. They are paid this much. The commission tables are structured in this way. It from we hire one to we onboard one. 
it takes four months for them to get going and so forth. So for each of the product types that you have that you build into your Excel sheet, really you want to know how much does it cost? How does it work in the sense that can we actually keep funding and can we just scale it up? And how long does it take? Because if you have these three items, which says it can work at scale, I know exactly how much it costs and what the cost components are. And I know how long it takes from the time we fund it to we actually get the revenue. Now you have all the necessary components to build your Excel sheet backwards from the 100 million to where you are today. So if you are at 1 million today and you want to go to 100 million, you essentially say, well, if we're funded 5 million and we put it into our acquisition math quiz formula and we fund all the different acquisition models we have, how much revenue will we have in a year? What about two years? And then we get funded again, we can refund everything and move forward. And at some point, three, four, 10 years from now, you hit that 100 million. If the math doesn't add up, if you have to be too generous in your assumptions, like, oh no, we can get 40% of the market, which you can't, and so forth, then you need to change something. This is where you as a founder needs to innovate and come up with new ideas because the current ideas you have are not going to get you there. But if the current ideas you have are going to get you there and it's just an execution game, power to you. Just sort of lay it out and execute it. The input numbers that you show your, your funding partner, the VC in this series A is we've done it in the past. This is the plan for how we're going to do in the future. You can double check all our math, but we're going to hit a hundred million. So really giving us the Series A today is a no-brainer, given that you can see that we're going to raise both B and C and exit in five years' time. Yeah, this is just off the top of my head, the, the conversation I just had with these guys. And I see it a lot is that founders get so caught up in the present operations and their past numbers and hitting the next milestone that they forget that it's actually a marathon. You want to push through the next funding round and look to the future. And there are some specific focus areas and language that changes. It goes from narrative to spreadsheet over time because of always who the next buyer is. So funding is like a game of telephone. And the sooner you realize this, the better you can just play that game. Let me know what your thoughts are in the comments and like and subscribe and I'll keep hitting you up. And if you have questions, ask them in the comments as well and I'll see if I can answer. All right, take care.